recipe for an evening of sweet melancholy. A box of Kleenex, a photo of a lost lover, a six pack of cream soda, and a new album from Kate and Anna McGarrigal. Heartbeats Accelerating is their first in seven years, and it's a wistful catalog of human loss. In it, lovers depart, children grow up, and most of all, time passes. I ate dinner at the kitchen table by the light that switches on. I eat leftovers with mashed potatoes. No more candlelight, no more romance, no more small talk when the hunger is gone. After 15 years and six well-received albums, the sisters have become known for an utterly distinctive musical style and intensely personal lyrics. Their latest work is their most starkly emotional, to the point that one friend on hearing it wrote to ask if they were okay. They insist that they're fine and that the sadness they convey is not necessarily their own. In the case of this song, Kate McGarrigal found that the tragic life story of Mexican artist Frida Kahlo provided a poignant starting image. I guess it's it's easier to write songs like that in a sense, you know, it's kind of... Uh, what? Well, to write songs that... I mean, you know, you take a song like I Eat Dinner, uh, you know, I wrote that because I, I was reading a book about Frida Kahlo, and that's where I actually got the image from the thing. It wasn't so much from, you know, and then I translated it into my own life. But uh, but that that came from, from the book. It came from a little part in the book where Frida uh, is writing a letter to a friend and saying that, you know, she's divorced from her husband and her lover has left her, and she says, for the first time I have to eat dinner alone in the kitchen by myself with a candlelight. And I just, I, I took, the image I thought was terrific and I just kind of ran to the piano. I was halfway through the book and I said, this is a great image. And, and then suddenly something came out of that. But, cause I eat, I eat uh, uh, dinner in front of the TV set here. <laughs> and, uh... Love, love, wicked to be. Are you out there? Garigals have used everything from squeeze box to synthesizer to complement their voraciously eclectic musical style. They're equally at home in French or English idioms, and from those they've cobbled together a rare thing, an all-Canadian sound. They have blended as well the modern and the traditional. A new McGarrigal love song has an ancient ring to it. has always been far from mainstream and seldom heard on radio. They don't like videos or long tours, and they would never trade their kitchen table casual for black velvet evening gowns. But what they have is the undying love of a fiercely loyal audience, and that interest has kept them on the performing circuit year after year, putting their music out shyly, almost reluctantly. I think a long time ago when we sort of made the commitment to do this, I, I said, I hope that at the age of 45, well, let's say this is when I was maybe 28 or 29 when I said this, I said, I hope I'm not going to be singing in some sleazy bar when I'm 45. <laughs> but um, we have sung in a few sleazy bars, and I've been 45. <laughs> we, we love music. We love playing it. We love kind of like, you know, sitting down. We never want to become mechanical, where you just do the thing, same thing, night in, night out. And so we tend to kind of like maybe pick a little special things where we play at because I think our output on those points is more important than us going out every night for 10 months and doing exactly the same songs the same way. 
I, th I don't think we'd be able to do that. We've never been able to do that. The McGarrigal's unique contribution to Canadian music begins in the mid-1940s here in saint sauveur des monts just an hour north of Montreal. The McGarrigal family was Anglophone, but the daughters, they decided, would be educated in French at a local convent school. From that point on, the McGarrigals lived with a foot in both cultures, juggling languages and learning two disparate musical traditions, one at home, the other in the schoolyard. My father said you should go to the French schools and learn the, the French-Canadian culture. Everybody went, the Krugers went, the Heinz, everybody. Yeah. There was the only school in town, and everybody went to the French school. And what we used to do at recess, we'd, we'd play games, and, and like, they're actually like rounds. We'd make rounds and sing songs. And what would happen would be, because we couldn't speak very good French, you'd tend to get into the songs and sing them more, and be, perhaps be more aware of the songs than maybe the average kid who was in the schoolyard, because to them it was just, you know, it was just a time, a way to pass 15 minutes. To us, it was a... It was a way of learning the language, was to sing the songs. The biculturalism learned in Saint Sauveur embedded itself deeply in both their music and lyrics. It provided the exotic sounds on two superb late 1970s albums and led them to record their first all French album in 1981. Both the humor and the emotional depth of their material came through in both languages. Although neither still lives here, Saint Sauveur remains a familiar refuge. But it is in Quebec, and nationalism is changing Quebec in a way that at least symbolically threatens the cultural blend that makes them so special. We're not politicians, you know, and I mean, the thing is, I live just sort of across the border in Ontario, but I know from living there, because I live in a, a basically a French-Canadian neighbor, uh, neighborhood, I guess you'd call it 70% French, um, I would be really unhappy if Quebec separated. But I, and, I and, and I think it's inevitable. In some form, I mean, I don't think it's going to be like, you know, rockets in the sky and stuff like that. I think there's just more of a redefinition de of, of, of powers, you know, who has powers over education, who has powers over what, you know. I mean, I, I think the, I, the dream of Canada being one, I don't know if that's, that really works. Well, know? I mean, maybe it was never one, but the fact of the matter is, is we're all here now under, you know, the label, the banner Canada, and I think it would really be awful to, uh, maybe it's a marriage of convenience that... It might be awful to than you, a marriage but it might not love. be awful to other people. Yeah, that's, no, that's true, but the thing is, I'm thinking about every other place. I'm thinking, I know a lot of people, you know, are sort of down on Clyde Wells and that, Newfoundland, but I've been to Newfoundland, and I know what that place is like. I mean, those, they're fantastic people. I mean, I would, and I know they, they, were, they came late to Confederation. A lot of people said, you know, like, uh, you know, we'd rather have Quebec than Newfoundland, but I, I don't know. We're all here together. We've got to figure it out. And, God, um, Anna, you sound like a politician. I, no, I'm not a politician. <laughs> you do. I just, I, it, it would just break my heart. Love is a money Garigal's music does not live on politics and will not die because of it. It's predicated on things less transient, a sense of home, an understanding of the deep, complex bonds built up by family and friends. It's based on a community of musicians built up over 15 years. Most of all, it's based on the secure relationship of two sisters who never wanted to do anything but sing.
the journal, I'm Paul McGrath.